You know, <clears throat> we have, we talked about our inheritance today in the Sunday school, but I want you to look in Ephesians chapter and notice <clears throat> he talks about in chapter 5. And I'm going to use this phrase and then we'll go from there. I want to read verse 32 <clears throat> as my text verse. And he's talking about the relationship that we have with Christ. It's like a relationship of uh, a husband and wife. Now he's not saying that the body of Christ is the, is the bride of Christ like you hear religion today. And uh, you're not the bride of Christ. You are the body of Christ. And before we get started, let me show you who the bride is right quick. Or turn over to Revelation and look in Revelation chapter, <clears throat> I think it's 21. Revelation chapter 21. Now I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I'm going to begin in verse 1. Revelation 21, verse 1. Now look in what he says in verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as... And that little word, as, is very important. As a bride adorned for her husband. Come down to verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he came and carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was the light unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And then he goes and describes this city. The point I want you to see is the angel said unto him, Come hither, and I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. What did he show him? Showed him the city, didn't he? Well, if you're going to see the, what is the bride? If somebody comes to me and says, What's the bride of Christ? What are you going to tell them? Well, I'm going to tell them it's the city. Isn't that what he showed him? Now, I realize it's who's in the city. I heard a guy preaching this morning talking about going to heaven, and he described this city, that that's heaven. The city's coming down to this earth. They got to hang, they got their roots so deep in this earth there that they don't want even hear about being in heavenly places out there. But look what he look at this city. Verse 12. <clears throat> and had a wall great, high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Now who's in this city? Why twelve? Why not 14? Lord, why you got 12 gates? Why not 27? Why 12? Why is there 12 months in a year? Why didn't he make 14 months in a year? Why, what has 12 got to do with anything? How many sons did Jacob have? You know, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, 
And Israel had 12 sons. Everything that's connected with this earth, now you listen to me, everything that's connected to this earth is connected by the number 12, and the number 12 is who gets this earth. Do you know how many natural boundaries are in the earth? I'll give you one guess. Twelve. Wow. Do you know how many nations is going to be on this earth during the millennial and when this city comes down? I'll give you one guess. Twelve. Do you realize? I mean, in fact, turn over with me to Isaiah and look in Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. You know, they're wanting that river of life and they're wanting that street of gold. And they don't even know what the Lord has prepared for them. Notice what he says in Isaiah chapter 66. Notice what he says there in Isaiah chapter 66. I'm going to read in verse 7 first. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a, what kind of child? Man child. Verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Then the children is the man child that was born at once. Am I right or wrong? Now he's talking about the man child and he's talking about Children being born at once. A nation being born at once. Now y'all getting that? Look over in the passage. It goes on. He goes on. He talks about in verse 21. And I also take uh, for them the priest and the Levite, saith the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm dieth not, neither their fire shall be quenched, and they shall be of a whoring unto all flesh. Somebody's going to be able to walk on this earth, look down into the lake of fire, and see the flesh that rebelled against the Lord. As they going up to Jerusalem, the nations, twelve of them, are going to go up to the Lord. They got to go up there. Uh, you'll find in Mark chapter 9, I'm not going to read in there, but in Mark chapter 9, Jesus talked about the fire that's not quenched and the, where the worm dieth not. He's talking about this passage right here. The lake of fire is on this earth, folks. Look back in Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. And notice in Isaiah 35, <clears throat> you, and I just begin in verse 8. Isaiah 35, verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. Now, what's pitch? Not like tar? Oil. Do you know why there's so much oil over there? 
Do you know? Well, anyway. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone. <laughs> Isn't that something? Fire and brimstone. And the land thereof shall become burning what? Pitch. And it shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up for how long? Forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now look back in the passage there in verse 6. Uh, notice what he's talking about. Well, come back to verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. That's in Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. I'll be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as the fallen fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. And Idumea is Edom today. Over there, and that's what the, well anyway. And upon the people of my curse to judgment, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and of goats, and with the fat of the kidneys of the rams. For uh, the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea, uh, the country of Edom. And the unicorn shall da uh, come down with them. And the bullocks and the bulls and the land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with the fatness thereof. And it's the day of tribulation. It's that time in the future. The point I want you to understand that there is a land over there, somewhere over there, it, God Almighty is going to turn the dust under brimstone and the thing's going to be turned to pitch and it's going to be set on fire and when people go up, the nations go up to worship the Lord, they'll go up three times a year and they'll go up on the feast days and then they'll go up and as they're going up, they'll be able to look over there and see that burning pitch of people that's in the lake of fire and which is the second death. You don't want to go there. Now look with me and turn back to Revelation and look in Revelation and notice in Revelation chapter 22. In Revelation chapter 22. <clears throat> he's still talking about the... Uh, I tell you what, go back to verse in chapter 21, verse 23. He's talking about the city. And the city hath no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of the Lord did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Now watch it. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there is, uh, shall be no light night there. And they shall bring uh, the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever wor worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know something? That tells me there's going to be some rebellion going on even after everything because of what he just said there. Now, if everybody on the earth at this time was perfect, would they be things like whosoever maketh abomination or maketh a lie or anything that would defile the city? If there wasn't nothing on the earth like that, why even put the verse in there? Now, think about it, folks. Verse chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of, of water of life, clear as a crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street, be the street of gold, 
uh, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare how many fruits? Twelve. Twelve manner of fruits, and yield her fruit every month. How many months? Twelve. Yield her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb uh, shall be in, the, uh, be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Turn back and look at the servants. Look in Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7. And take also in chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And notice in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 1. I'm trying to show you who's in that city. Who gets that city? In, or who's the bride in the city? Who's the priest in the city? That's where the priest is going to be there. Now look in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God uh, gave unto him. And God gave the revelation to Jesus Christ. It ain't the revelation of St. John divine. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to Jesus Christ. Now look. He said gave unto him to show unto the body of Christ. No, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So John is one of the servants. You got to remember that. Oh, this thing has to do with a nation. It has to do with a priesthood. And it has to do with servants. Now look in Revelation chapter 7. Who are the servants? Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. Talking to the angels, he said, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So who's the book of Revelation wrote to? It's wrote to show unto his servants. Who's the servants? Those that get sealed, uh, the seal of God in their forehead. Well, who are they? Well, look in verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, the servants. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the body of Christ. No, the tribes of the children of Israel. Don't you get it? They're part of that chosen generation back there that Peter said to the people in the day of Pentecost, save yourselves from this untoward generation. He was forming a new generation, a new nation of Israel, and it has to do, they're the servants, and bless your heart, you can take it to the bank, they're the bride of Christ. And it has nothing to do with you being in the body of Christ. I was teaching along this line one time, and this lady said, I'll never forget, she said, shook her head. She said, You took the water out of my baptistry, and now you're taking the gold out of my city. I said, no, the water's still in the baptistry and the gold's still in the city. It's just not yours. <laughs> I'm taking you out of the city. Folks, I, the city is where the priesthood's going to be and the priesthood is the nation that Isaiah talked about being born once. Are y'all still with me? Man, time flies, don't it? Look with me and turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. 
<clears throat> and look in verse uh, 1, Revelation 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. Now you see that S-I-O-N? In the Old Testament, it's Hebrew is Z-I-O-N, Zion. Here, Zion, the Greek spell it. And with him, a hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. I want you to look at something now. Turn back to Revelation and look in, uh, in chapter 3. In chapter 3, I believe it is. And notice these people. <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. They will have to overcome. And the book of Revelation is wrote to them, showing them what they got to overcome, what they got to go through, and they're going to have the seal of God in their foreheads. They will have the power of God in order to get through and in the middle of that tribulation. Do you see them standing on Mount Zion? They lead the earth and go up there in the middle of the tribulation with the Lord. And people say, well, there's a mid-tribulation rapture and it's the body of Christ. No, it's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not even in the book of Revelation. You say, well, there's seven churches in the book of Revelation. I don't care if there are 1,400 churches in the book of Revelation. They're not the body of Christ. It's not the church that Paul talked about. Now look, if it is, you're in trouble. Verse 5, Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. I want to ask you something today. Do you have any fear of having your name blotted out of the book of life? Do you have to overcome anything in order to keep your name from being blotted out of the book of life? No, you're sealed under the day of redemption. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're not a part of the bride of Christ. They have to overcome. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Folks, don't you understand? They're waiting for their high priest. The high priest is winning behind the veil. And when the second coming of Christ comes, he comes without the veil. Well, he reveals himself unto that priesthood and he's their high priest. Bless God, you're not a priest. You're an ambassador for Christ. Now look about this nation. So you're getting all worked up. Well, religion gets me worked up. Do you realize people are so confused today and God is not the author of confusion. You know why they're confused today? Because religion teaches them that there are only one church and one body in the book of Acts and Jesus Christ established it and Peter and them's in the body of Christ and we're spiritually Israel. Well, I'm not spiritually Israel. You're not spiritually Israel. We don't replace the nation Israel. The nation Israel, God today is their low and my, not my people, but someday He will take them back. And God today is not dealing with one nation for salvation. He's dealing with all nations for salvation. God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. He gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God will save anybody, anywhere, anytime if they'll trust what Christ did for them on the cross. This is God today is dispensing out grace and we call it the dispensation of grace. There is no unpardonable sin. There is no sin that God can't forgive or didn't forgive at Calvary and there's no sinner that's so bad that God's grace can't save. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Folks, religion 
has damned more people and sealed their fate to hell than all the honky-tonks in the world. You can take somebody that never been to church and you can present the gospel to them and you can get them saved and they'll understand this Bible. But the hardest thing to get people to see today is to swallow their pride of religion and to say that I'm a sinner, I need to be saved, trust Christ and get saved and then give up their religion. The night I got saved, I junked mine. They never done nothing for me anyway. Like I've said hundreds of times, I walked the aisle, I was baptized for five times. I mean, dunks. I've been, I've been in the running water, steel water. I've been in cold water. I've been in lukewarm water. I've been in the Baptist. I've been in the creeks. I've been in the ponds. But now, one time that I ever go into that water as a male, you know what I come out as? A male. But the baptism that Paul talks about, the one baptism, brother, you go into that baptism, you don't care as neither male nor female. In that body of Christ, you're identified as Christ. You're in His body. You're not the bride. But look at this thing. They can lose their salvation. But that ain't all. Notice what he says there. Turn, look in chapter three, uh, 2, Revelation chapter 2. In verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto when? The end. To him will I give power over the nations. And he, he that overcometh, shall rule them with a rod of iron. Who's them? He's going to rule them. Who they have power over? The nations. And He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall, be, shall they be broken to shivers even as I receive of my Father. And I will give Him the overcomer, the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And look at this thing. This man child going to rule with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 12. Notice what he says. In verse there, uh, verse chapter 12, verse 2. <clears throat> And she being with child. And by the way, uh, let me go back and read verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and uh, the moon under her feet and upon her head. The cr a crown of how many stars? You want the interpretation of that? Turn back, hang on to Revelation. Turn back to Genesis. And look at Genesis chapter, I think it's Genesis chapter 37. Look back there in Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> and notice this thing about Genesis chapter 37. And notice what he says in verse, uh, verse 8. He's had a dream. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? This is talking about Joseph now. Or shalt thou indeed have a dominion over us? And by the way, a hundred and some times, Joseph is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis. Check them out. It goes on. Uh, indeed have dominion over us. And they hated him yet more, the more uh, for his dreams and for his words. Now look down in verse 9. Here's the interpretation of Revelation 12. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars. Say, well, I thought there was twelve. Well, Joseph's one of them, don't you understand? He's a star telling another eleven. He said, made obeisance to me. They bowed down to me. The eleven did. 
and he told it to his father. Now watch what Joseph said. And to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, uh, to the earth? And his brethren envied him. I want you to know the twelve brethren, the twelve stars, the sun, and the moon. The sun, type of God the Father, jo Joseph, uh, was a son of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had twelve sons, and they're the twelve tribes of Israel. Now look at this thing. Notice what he said. Verse 1, And is a woman clothed with the sun, and uh, the moon under her feet, and upon her head the crown of twelve stars. That's a type of the Israel. That's a type of of the nation. Out of that nation, there's going to bring forth a new nation. Out of that nation, there's going to be a man-child. People, it's not the Lord. Look down in verse 2. And she being with child, cried tra uh, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Remember Isaiah 66, where I read to you, how that there, before Zion travailed, she brought forth. Verse 3, There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. No doubt who that feller is. That's, that's Satan himself. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her man-child as soon as it was born. Now watch verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. Look back and compare it with me. Back in chapter 2 now. Look in chapter 2, verse 27. In verse 2, uh, 26, I'm sorry. In chapter 2, verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, the tribulation, to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now look back in chapter 12, verse 4, uh, and she brought forth a man child who shall rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was called up unto God and his throne bless your heart chapter 12 is the middle of the tribulation period it's the middle of the wrath of God that new man that man child is the birthing of a new nation the 144,000 they go into the city they're the bride of Christ you're the body of Christ. You have an inheritance far above all heavens out there. Your place, you're going to rule and reign with Christ someday. You're sealed, you're baptized by one spirit into that one body. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Folks, Paul's your apostle, not Peter, James, and John. I love to read Peter and James and John. I, but we're not a nation of priests. We're ambassadors for Christ. We have a different message. We have the gospel of Christ to offer this world. What is that gospel? What is that good news? Christ died for your sins and was buried. And God raised him for your justification. Everything that would separate you from God, Christ paid for. Isn't that wonderful? There's no barrier now between you and God. You're here, you're lost, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Right now you're trying to think of a time that you as a sinner, as a sinner, you, you trusted what He did. You trusted that He died for you personally. Salvation is something that's personal. And you're trying to think about it. You're trying to wonder about it. Have I ever done it? Well, I want to ask you to do it now. I want you to do it now if you haven't. Believe me, He died for you. He went to that cross. And He took your sins. And He became what you are. And He bore your own nature that produces all the sins of the world. And God Almighty put Him to death and put him to torture, and he's the death stung him. 
till God said, I'm satisfied. And on that third day, God the Father raised him from the dead so that he could justify you. Why could he justify you, a sinner? He can justify you, a sinner, by knowing that his son died for all your crimes that you commit against God. He paid for it all. And God accepted the payment. God will save the world if they'll just trust that He died for them. That's the simplicity that is in Christ. It's not walking the aisle, not coming down here. This is no altar. This is platform. We built it up so you could see me. I'm not up here to be over you. I want you to see what I'm doing. I want to look you in the face. I want to tell you about a Savior that died for all your sins. And you don't have to go to the lake of fire. You can have eternal life if you simply will trust that He died for you and was buried. And God raised Him. God was satisfied with the sacrifice that He made for you. Everything has been done that needed to be done for you to have eternal life. Believe it. Accept it. Paul said in Romans 5, receive the atonement. Receive it as for you. The night I got saved, there was no generality to it. The night I got saved, I didn't care what the world... I didn't care whether he died for the world. I didn't care about that. The night I got saved, I believed it for myself. The night I got saved, I remember it as well as anything. Lord, I know you died for me. I know you went to that cross for me. And when I acknowledge that, that's when the Lord saved me. For me. For me. For somebody like me. He went to a cross for me. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. For me. And I have eternal life not because I preach, not because I come to church. I have eternal life because He paid for me for all of my sins. That would ban me from God. He wiped the slate clean. And now I stand before the Lord in Christ as pure and clean. So, well, you don't live it. Don't matter how I live. It ain't about me. It's about Him. Thank you for being here. Would you stand? If you haven't trusted Christ, will you trust Him? Father,